And so we're going to start from this place because it's a series on trauma. The definition of trauma is this, that I have given. A wound that causes you to realize that your world cannot be trusted. And so because that's the definition, then I would say next that all of us in some capacity have been traumatized. And it's subjective. And so your trauma is not my trauma, or maybe it's the same trauma, but we've internalized it in a totally different way. Now, some things are a bit universal, things like divorce or abuse. I mean, most people don't just kind of glide through things like that. But there are other things that are seemingly insignificant to you, but for every reason, they've rocked my world because it's a wound that caused me to realize that my world couldn't be trusted. That the people that I thought, from a naive perspective, were perfect, were no longer perfect. The things that I thought could never change all of a sudden shifted, and now my response to that pain has been cyclical in my life where it has caused a lot of damage. And I told you this last week, and I want to say this again because it's critical. The pain is not the primary problem. Write that down. What do you mean the pain is not the primary problem? The pain is obviously a major problem, but it's not the primary problem in my experience as a therapist. As someone who's pastoring you, shepherding to you, preaching to you, and then spent the last 15 years working or longer with people with psychological problems, I will tell you the pain is not the primary problem. The response to the pain is the much bigger problem. Even taking it a step further, not knowing your specific story, I want to clarify this idea as well. Whatever's happened to you isn't your fault. If you're a victim of a specific trauma, whatever has happened to you is not your fault, but your response to what's happened to you is your sin and you have to own it. The pain is not the problem, but the response to the pain is the bigger issue. Rick Warren says this, and you can start saying it with me because I love it and I'm gonna keep saying it. Pain is inevitable, misery is what? Good. Pain is inevitable, we wanna walk in freedom. We don't wanna have the same stuff. Five years from now, we should be further along in Christ, helping other people, and we'll never do that if we don't grab a hold of that concept. Pain is inevitable. It's actually used by God. He doesn't create the pain, but he uses the pain. Pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. And so we have to deal with our stuff. I told you last week, I wrote it on my phone seven months ago, if you don't deal with your past, your past will do what? It'll deal with you. This is fun. It's like a back and forth. I told you last week, what you think is gone is simply lying dormant, and it can strike you at any moment. And so I want to kind of also start with this idea. I want us to understand this concept because it directly affects where we're about to go today. Today will be heavy, and it's kind of like lifting weights where it hurts, but it's a good hurt. You're like, well, that's not my experience. That's why I don't lift weights. Trust me. Um, I'm not the strongest person in the world, but for whatever reason, I like to go to the Y and lift weights, uh, probably because it just releases all sorts of stuff in my own life. That it's, it's a healthy outlet for me, and it's a good hurt. And so this is going to hurt a bit as we start unpacking this stuff, but here we go. Uh, there's a psychology to crisis that I want you to understand. Uh, a Christian psychologist by the name of Henry Cloud has really explored this. Uh, the psychology of crisis, he says, is this is that we all have a framework or script for how we see the world, and we tend to follow that script because it allows us to make sense of everything that we experience. And the psychological term for this is scripting. And within the script of life, and here's where the trauma comes in, within the script of life, we believe this lie that life should be relatively easy, that life should be fair, that life should be predictable, and then we get hit off of our you know, off of our high horse, we realize, we get blindsided by the reality that that's not always the way that life goes. And there's a comfort in predictability. There's a comfort in knowing what's coming next. Why do you think that I can tell you where you're gonna sit today? Are you tracking? I already know. Because your life is scripted just like my life is scripted and you tend to be fairly predictable and that's modest. For me, I'm highly predictable. I eat the same breakfast I have a Rise Energy drink because I don't drink coffee, so don't judge me. I have two small bags of Planters Dry Roasted Peanuts or Diamond Blue Diamond Smoked House Almonds. Every Monday, the staff knows that I'm going to have the same thing at the table unless someone brings high carbs. 
It's then going to shift from staff meeting to counseling appointments to sermon prep to future planning to dinner to hanging out with the family, Joseph's basketball, Jets basketball, Ari's volleyball, hit reset, start the new week, and hope it all ends soon. And so the reality of crisis is this, that I think I know what's coming And then the traumatic event happens and it rocks my world because I'm scripted. And I like to know what's next. And because I've been through a few things in my life, I don't like surprises. Who in here likes surprises? I don't like surprises. I like the script. And when I get hit, it freaks me out and I go into a tailspin. And I'm sure you're some of the same way. And so it takes this script of trust and predictability, and what trauma does when you realize your world is not safe, it's it's like a vase, and it smashes on the ground to a million pieces, and if you don't deal with that, you are in massive trouble. Those things that we thought were the safe are not safe, and those people that we thought we could trust, we now realize can no longer be trusted. And so without a new script for understanding how things work, Our emotions stay in this place of out of control. And I know that's a long intro, but here's where I'm going now. No one likes to feel out of control, and so then the overreaction to that is what we're going to talk about today, is that then we we try to control everything. So the title of today is simply Trauma and Control. Because we want to be in control, And because we feel out of control, we will then do a power grab that we don't realize that we're doing. And the problem with the idea of control is, number one, control is an illusion. You will never really have it. You're not God. You weren't designed to. And so because you weren't designed to have it, you'll never truly obtain it. And round and round and round and round and round it goes. And so the woman at the well, she gets weak too. Same text, little different perspective. Her life's out of control, and she's making a few moves towards control that I want you to see before we get specifically into this CR material. I'm going to read the story again. Verse 4, and as he passed through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sinkar near the field of Jacob where he'd be given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus wearied as he was from his journey, and he was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. I told you last week, the hours are a little different. That's like 12 o'clock midday. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? A woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water, underline that. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Here's how I know she has some control issues. She is the poster child for this trauma series. We'll talk about other people, but she's going to get more than one week, as you can see, week two. Here's what we know about this woman. Here's what people with control issues do. She controlled her environment. I told you last week, solitude is something you choose for some time to draw close to God. Isolation is what you choose all the time to be away from the people of God. You don't get time with the Lord, you get ousted by others. And so she's trying to control this narrative of her life where she realizes that people can't be trusted, and so she's isolating herself. Everyone would have gone to the well at around 8 or 9 a.m. The women would have had that time together, and she was a social pariah, and you're going about to see why, and if you already were here last week, you know why. And so she doesn't want to be around people because people aren't safe and people gossip and people backbite. And so now she's saying, instead of surrendering these things like my reputation to the Lord, because she doesn't even know the Lord, she's saying, I am going to separate myself from the community that I live in and I'm not going to have this moment at the water well. She hears the whispers. She knows the sin. And she's decided that she's going to control the script. 
Jesus, knowing that, in verse 16, says this. Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Underline that. I think it's significant. I'll show you why in a second. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and no one now, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. I would say kind of. I think she is doing this in her need to control. She's trying to not just control her environment. She's trying to control her narrative. Remember, everyone in the small community knows her, but Jesus is from the outside passing through, and she doesn't realize who he is. She doesn't realize that uh, he is the mind of God. He is God incarnate in flesh. He knows everything about her circumstance, and so she's telling him kind of like a half-truth. He says, give me this water, or she says, give me the water. He says, where's your husband? She says, I don't have a husband, and she's kind of just telling him half the story because that's what control freaks do. They want to give you what they think you need to know. And she, she may not technically be married yet, but she's been going from person to person to person. She's been married five times. Now she's living with a guy, and so instead of humility and transparency of saying, when you know, he says, go get your husband, and she gets it to divulge, well, actually, that's been a huge issue in my life. I go from relationship to relationship. She basically just says and helps him think, well, I'm just single. Another thing we know about her control is that she controls unhealthy relationships. In a culture that is very misogynistic, where women have few rights, where they're not treated well, where mostly they're illiterate, She's been, for all practical purposes, how we would define in today's world, uh, in some form of abusive relationship to abusive relationship to abusive relationship, and she has tried to control that narrative. And so she takes her pain from one relationship and places it on the next, and instead of just having the same pain, now it's pain uh, compounding on itself, and she's got all sorts of stuff as she meets Jesus, but she's controlling the narrative. Instead of saying, no more relationships, this isn't working for me. Even if it means I have nothing financially because of the misogynistic world that I live in, I choose to abstain because this isn't working for me. She's controlling it, and now she's not even married, and she's living with some guy who's probably abusive like the rest. And so she's trying to control the narrative of unhealthy relationships in her life. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you'll worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the Spirit and truth. And the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And here's how it ends. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And now the climactic part of the story, Jesus says to her, a Samaritan, she's a nothing in his society. I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. He's, he's letting her know that he is the one that they've been waiting for. And Jesus says to his disciples when they came back, they marveled that he was talking with the woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? And so the woman left her jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man. And if you didn't underline this last week, get it this week. Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of town and were coming to him. Here's the transition. And then we're going to apply specifically through the material that I've been asking you to read. The transition goes from a place of control of the narrative and the environment and the bad dysfunctional relationships from a place of control to a place of surrender. She gives up control, and she does so in this statement. Come and see a man that's told me all that I've ever done. She was trying to control the narrative of hiding her past, and now she's saying, I have stuff that I have to deal with, and this Messiah, could he be the Messiah, is the one who's been reading my mail. 
He knows my trauma. He knows my past. And it's okay to be vulnerable again. It's okay to be transparent. It's okay to be on a road to recovery. It's okay. And in fact, it's mandated as a follower of Christ to go from a place of control to surrender. And that's where we're going today. And so here's where we need to take some notes. This is going to be incredibly practical. This is stuff that is changing my own life. And here I have it on a platter for you. There is something that happens in this idea of control that's deeply theological. It can be defined as the God complex. Behind this need to control the narrative of your life is a deeper, scarier belief that God can't be trusted. And if God can't be trusted, then by default, I need to become God at least over the small bubble that I think that I can control if God himself can't be trusted. And so whatever happened to you, whatever happened in your point of life that you would define as a trauma as we're walking through this series, at some point you told yourself something that you might not know you told yourself, and it's that God can't be trusted because if God can be trusted, then why did that happen? If God can be trusted, then why are you hurting? And so what you've said without realizing you're probably saying it is that you now need to become God, and so you're going to control the script. Let me build my case. This is right out of this book. All of it from the rest of the time we're together is right here. Things we try to control, and I can promise you it's really hard to dispute anything that's about to be said. Things you try to control, things I try to control, here they are. Number one, your image. This is what she did. She tries to do some image control with Jesus because she doesn't think he knows everything about her. Go get your husband. I'm not married. Image control. He doesn't know it's been five times and I'm living with a guy. Image is built around the basic belief that people cannot see the real us and I have to play God if the world cannot be trusted and I have to take over the job of being God and controlling everything, then it becomes critical. Write it down. It becomes critical what you think of me. If I'm God, if I'm in control, if there's nothing above me that stands over me and says, I'm running your life, then if I'm running the ship and you don't like me, then I have nothing left. Does that make sense? If you take God out of the equation and you don't like me and and I don't like what's going on in my life, then I can't somehow hide that or control the image of that, then I am in massive, massive trouble, which is why I would suggest to you that social media takes off the way that it has in the last 20 years. Is it not primarily just image control? Here's what I found. When people are hiding something, you can build your own case as to whether or not you think this is true because this is just, this part's just conjecture. When people are hiding something, have you found it to be true That sometimes, just sometimes, they get really preachy on social media? Think about it. I have the luxury of knowing behind the scenes, right? Behind the curtain when it's it's not unveiled, okay? When people have stuff going on in their life, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes they just fall apart. Sometimes they, they put way too much out there on social media, like, my life's a wreck. You know, who can help me? And you're going, ah, you know, probably shouldn't use that venue. But sometimes they go the inverse route. Sometimes they go the opposite route. Sometimes when they're hiding stuff on social media, they get like they want to be the next Beth Moore or you know Priscilla Schreier. And so and I, I know these things going on in their life because I'm a pastor and you know I, I know and and of course I don't say anything to anybody, but I'm going, man, is this weird or what? And all of a sudden, you you probably need to have this humility that you're walking in of going, I don't have everything figured out. And now you're like the next Beth Moore and you've got all the answers for everyone. And I think the psychology of that is image protection. If somehow I put it out there that I'm okay, then everyone won't know that I'm messed up. And so we try to control our image, and as I keep laying these out, they get heavier. Here's something that a lot of us do that's highly, highly destructive. We don't just try to control our image and our need to control, we try to control people. Because our world can't be trusted, and when I say world, mostly we're talking about people. Because your most traumatic events surround not just extra things on the outside. It it surrounds this idea of people that you thought you could trust, 
that you now realize you can no longer trust. And so we become control freaks in our interpersonal relationships. Parents control kids. Kids control parents. Wives control husbands. Husbands control wives. And at the heart of all of this, we get expert status on becoming manipulative. Expert status. Like pros. And our preferred methods of control are guilt and shame and anger and fear. And if you live in the Midwest, you've become an absolute master at the silent treatment. Have you not? You've perfected it. That you're going to leverage people's emotions and you're going to withhold affection. If you don't do what I want you to do, then I'm going to withhold affection and give you the honor of trying to earn that affection back. It's a power play. And so in our relationships, because we're scared to death to lose control, we're scared to death to lose those people in our lives that have become false idols in our life, we manipulate them, and maybe we know it and maybe we don't, but I imagine if you just dissect it, you have to concede you've done some of that. Or as it gets heavier, how about this one? We try to control our problems. Celebrate Recovery says this, that when interviewing a TV repairman, he was asked, What's the worst damage you've ever seen on TVs? He said, any damage resulting in people trying to fix their TV on their own. Because most people don't know how to fix a TV. And what I've told you for the last 11 years straight is you can't fix your own problems because you are the problem. And maybe you've heard it, I haven't said it in a while. Broken can't fix broken. Right? So we try to control our own problems. We try to do it on our own. I don't need help. I don't need counseling, I don't need recovery, I don't need gospel accountability, I don't need God's word over my life, I don't need an active prayer life, I don't need Jesus Christ himself, because I can do it. And the infamous question over the years at New Life has always been, how is that working for you? And so the reason this is called gospel, the gospel and trauma, and not trauma and try to make yourself better, it's because the gospel speaks to these issues in an, in an opposite way of what we've been told. The gospel doesn't tell us that we're powerful. The gospel tells us that we can all th- do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Scripture tells us that, that he must increase, that I must decrease. Scripture tells us that, that I've been crucified with Christ and, and I no longer even live. It's not even my life. How can I have control over something that's not even mine? But Christ lives in me. And lastly, we try to control our pain before I move long. How much time have you spent running from, avoiding, escaping, denying, reducing, or postponing your pain? So you've had this issue in your life that you're ignoring, and you've turned to every other thing besides the Savior. It can take on things that everyone knows are wrong. It can take on things that some people think are wonderful. But here's just a few examples. Maybe it's getting drunk. It's beginning alcoholic. It's drugs. Maybe you, you mask your pain through your career or withdrawing or being hypercritical of others. Maybe you mask your pain through sex. Many people sitting in the seats today, it would be pornography statistically. How many of you chase, like the woman at the well, the next relationship as a means of running from your own brokenness? The problem with this is it doesn't just have the capacity to hurt you. I need you to hear me say this. If you are running from your pain or trying to control your pain, it doesn't work, and it doesn't just have the capacity to hurt you. It has the capacity to absolutely destroy you, and that endorphin release in the temporary is no way to be closer to Jesus and it's keeping you from Christ. Those are the things that we try to control and here are the consequences of our control. Write them down. The consequences of our control, number one is fear. When you try to control everything that you can't even control, this is a massive, massive undertaking. Like, like the magnitude of, of the size of the world on your shoulders. There's so many moving parts. And out of everything we've gone through so far, the hardest thing that you cannot control is people. And so because they're this false idol in your life and you're attempting to control them, you're always walking in this insecurity and it never works. 
Nothing will break you down faster emotionally than trying to control the narrative of someone else's life that you have no control over. And so the consequence of control, number one, is fear. Here's another one, frustration. It was said here that the general manager of the universe is a massive job description. Anyone ever go to Chuck E. Cheese? Anyone ever think when those animals are singing it's a bit demonic? It's like Terminator, they're all robots. Put yourself back, back in Chuck E. Cheese if you are a millennial or, or, or even as old as me and balding and you remember that time at Chuck E. Cheese, there's this game that Baker talks about and he calls it the parable of the control freak. It's called whack-a-mole. Anyone? You get this mallet and the mole pops up and what do you do? It's very descriptive, isn't it? You get this mallet and you whack the mole, and what happens after that? It might not pop up, but guess what happens? Like three more. That's the parable of the control freak. That's the frustration that you walk in. If you're really in control, if you're really in control, write this down. If you can remember this analogy, just put whack-a-mole on your, on your notes and try to remember what I was talking about. And then write this down. If I'm really in control, then why don't I have the power to just unplug the machine? Why do I only have the power to suppress one mole while three more pop up? It's incredibly frustrating, and it's designed to be frustrating because God's bringing us to a place of surrender. And you're trying to control all these scripts. It's frustrating. Number three, it's exhausting. There's fatigue involved. Denial requires massive amounts of emotional energy in your life. And so instead of problem solving, instead of going to the cross, instead of giving things to Jesus, problem solving is replaced with problem denying, problem hiding, and problem avoiding. If you're in a constant state of fatigue, ask yourself this question, What pain, what pain am I running from? Lastly, this is the absolute reality of your situation, trying to control things you can't control. There's just failure. Failure in your life. Playing God has 100% failure rate. Trying to control things you can't control has 100% failure rate. And here's the good news, and this isn't really in the material, but I I thought of this, I want to share it with you, I've said it before. Failure's not a bad thing. And that sounds like a middle school coach just inspiring you, that's not what I mean. Failure in sports is a horrible thing, you always want to win, okay? (laughs) Failure, failure is not a bad thing when it comes to doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing, like controlling things that's for God to control, because failure allows for opportunity to come to Christ and push reset. Failure is not God's judgment, but God's mercy on your life. His mercy on your life is saying, you don't have to carry this burden. This isn't supposed to be. It's not designed to work in this way. And because you're operating outside of this design, my grace and my mercy on your life is you failing at something that you're not supposed to succeed at. Are you tracking? That's not judgment. That's That's grace. So, so here, here's how we're going to close. We're going to take communion together because all of this would be mute if there was no cure, if there was no redemptive peace to this, which there is. Everyone's scattering for communion. It'll be, it'll be a few minutes. You just, just hold tight. But we're going to take communion together in a minute or five. But I want to talk to you about the cure for this. And this is what has rocked my world. This is what's bringing healing in my life, and it will for you as well. I don't want to make this about me. I'm trying hard to use less analogies and more just here's the information. But I will tell you this. Look at me. I am not even self-admittedly. I am marriage-admittedly because marriage brings in a built-in accountability, does it not? I am, by virtue of having an accountability partner called Anne, a control freak. Not really with her. She's too tough. But in all of these things, I mean, pick your poison. 
I have these things from my past that, that come up. I don't really even realize they're there. And my response is control, 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 anxiety, 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 fatigue, burnout, 100% of the time, reset, telling myself the truth, applying the gospel in my life. It's not one and done. It's daily surrendering. It's daily going to the cross. It's daily saying, I'm going to have victory over this stuff because Christ has called me to a place of victory, and for some crazy reason, he's allowed me to preach the gospel. Maybe one of the most unqualified people in that sense of anybody in this room, but he's chosen me. And so what he's done for me in this time, in this season, that I think is really gonna catch wildfire for all of us, is he's given me some truths that he's given like 33 million other people apparently that you need to hear this morning. And the first one is this, it's the first step and we're gonna say it together. Here's the cure for control, let's put it on the screen. If you ever go to CR, you get it today. Let's say it together, admitting need. I realize, you're not saying it, are you ready? I realize that I am not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and that, here it is, wait, pause. Here's the controversy. Here's what you don't wanna do. Here's where you don't wanna go. Let's say it together because it's true, and that my life is unmanageable. If you want to find healing, because you should. That's the goal as a Christian. There are a couple of things that need to happen. Number one, you have to admit that you're weak and that Christ is strong. You will not find strength until you admit that you're weak. And the world has hijacked the truth. The world is telling us that we can do all things through us who strengthens us. That if we just try hard enough and believe enough in ourselves, then we can do anything we wanna do. The idea of being powerless as a remedy is completely backwards to popular belief. The world says you can do it. Christ says, look at me, Christ says, die to yourself. You can do all things through me, through Christ who strengthens me. And if you, if you think, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I believe that yet, but yet you're still like a magnet being drawn into this sermon series because you know you have some stuff, then I would just ask you if you disagree with this statement that has helped millions upon millions upon millions of people find health through the gospel of Jesus Christ and a new life in him, if you could have done it on your own and you don't have to admit that you're weak, then look at me when I tell you this, I don't need a pin in the room, I just need eye contact. If you could do it, then why have you not done it already? Why are you 40, 50 years old and still spiritually anemic? Why are you bouncing from one dysfunction to another instead of living in a place of victory in your life? If you can do it, why have you not done it? There's gonna be a prayer here in the end. I'm gonna pray specifically for these things, but I think there are three things that we need to admit. We're talking about trauma, we're talking about control, but let's just narrow it down to a few things that we can actually walk out of here with and pray together with and we take communion. Three things that I want you to write down in your prayer life. I am powerless to change my past. My life's unmanageable. I am powerless to change my past. That, that one is not controversial, is it? I mean, who in here has a time machine? No one. I'm powerless to change my past. It hurt, I still remember the pain, but nothing I can do to try and control things is ever gonna change my past. I absolutely have no power. Number two, activate this in your prayer life. I am powerless to control other people. This one's tricky. You might not realize you're doing it. And it's coming from a deep-seated sense of insecurity in your life where you desperately wanna control other people because other people have hurt you. And so the confession is I've enjoyed manipulating on some level and controlling, and I commit to stopping it. I'm responsible for my actions and not theirs. I cannot control them. I can't control my spouse. I can no longer control in any way my adult children. I can no longer control 
the people that I keep getting into more dysfunctional relationships with, this is not working. I am powerless to control other people. Number three, I admit that I am powerless to cope with the hurt from my past. Here's why I say that. Because if it were true, you would have already done it. And you don't need more willpower. You need Christ's saving power. You need the blood of Jesus Christ covering your sins. You need his resurrection power giving you new life. And you need the Holy Spirit to operate in a way where you can experience freedom because in your weakness, he is strong. And you will never have strength until you first confess to Jesus Christ right now in this room, right now online, that you are weak. The gospel is not about self-promotion. It's about surrender. And there's a humility in all of this that takes a while to digest. The cure for control is humility in Christ. Because God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. I told you at the start, hope you have your communion ready. We're going to take communion. I told you right out of the gate that this time together would be like lifting weights. That it's soreness, that it has a, like a, a sharp, acute pain to it, but through that pain comes health. That through that pain comes healing. And that the pathway to healing is paved in some pain, and that's not a bad thing. Jesus, I, I would ask that, that as, a, as a people, we would move positionally from this place of controlling the narratives of our pain, and we would move to a place of surrender. We'd move to a place of freedom, that we wouldn't have to protect our image, we wouldn't have to control people. We wouldn't have to control our own pain. We wouldn't have to mask things that we, we could be a transparent people that would just say, Jesus, it's, it's all because of you. We admit that you're, you're, that you're strong and that we're weak. We admit that in our weakness, you are made strong. We admit that you're the only way that we can change and that's the way it was designed to be. that we don't have to put on these fake masks anymore and come to church and have quick handshakes and leave this place unchanged. That the gospel changes everything. We commit that to you. And it's because of your blood that was shed and your body that was broken and your resurrection power. And we pray these things in your name. And everybody said, amen.